Do you have a favorite? Not meant to. But mostly the unloved ones, the unvisited ones, the cases that get dusty and ignored. All the broken and shunned creatures. Someone's got to care for them. Who shall it be if not us? Yes. Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the very best new and old ideas for living in this world. Coming to you from 43 degrees south on a small farm in deepest Tasmania. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. Thursday morning, exactly a week since the precise amount of rain uh, that we all enchanted for uh, arrived, uh, ending the fire emergency after 20-something days of bouncing around to various friends' houses, motor lodges, more expensive hotels that, to their credit, quietly gave us reduced rates given the situation we were in, a couple of Airbnbs, and so on, uh, back on the farm. I'm back on the farm for almost exactly a week, listening once again to the morning rain <laughs> fall on the roof, which it has done every single day since I got back. So apologies for skipping a week. Uh, as you might expect, uh, I was a little preoccupied. My OCD won't allow us to permanently skip a week, so I expect we'll do an extra show in February. Uh, consider this, I can do that by considering this the January solo show, even though it is in fact February. So yeah, sorry about that, but I, it wasn't just being preoccupied trying to tentatively, uh, you know, unpack and, and, and get the farm back down from war footing. It was also about trying to process how, um, all these experiences I've just undergone kind of come out of my mouth in human words uh, that, you know, capture the experience to my own satisfaction. And I've been sitting here making like little bullet points since about five in the morning of what I want to cover and some notes. And uh, yeah, I think we're good to go. Uh, what we talk about when we talk about dragons, uh, we're talking about language, uh, what it points at, and sometimes what it crushes. But before any of that, it is important for me to thank everyone who was with me <laughs> in this particular ordeal in various forms, especially those premium members that participated in the Vasuki Mantra working to successfully bring that enormous downpour of rain right across the state. Uh, exactly on the schedule um, of Thursday morning, I forecast when there was a 0% chance of rain, according to the Bureau of Meteorology. Uh, it actually rained very lightly every day from the group working until the Thursday morning when the rain dragons arrived and donked on these uh, enormous forest fires. So that's one of those rolling the hard six magical outcomes you can all be immensely proud of. And that's not one of those uh, minor greasings of probability. That's changing the whole universe. So well done. And once again, thank you. Be proud of yourselves. I'll have more to say about the tactics and what actually happened towards the end of the show. But first, what we talk about when we talk about dragons is a good example of how we hit the shortcomings in both a Cartesian mode of thinking as well as some of its, frankly, weaker 20th century attempted solutions. And I know I've kind of mentioned this on various shows before, but um, if you look at something like quote-unquote postmodernism, uh, it is a sort of ersatz animism as an epistemology. So, I, And I say ersatz because it has that hysterical fear of transcendentalism and its stepchild uh, essentialism, uh, which is historically understandable, given that it kind of emerged in a post-war French context, right? But if you look at, say, Derrida's broad ideas that, you know, everything in language points to everything else and you can't ever escape it, this is a grim version of animism where existence can only be relational rather than the, the atomized one we're taught and still 
um, if we don't think with or about it, get stuck in. But if you haunt that idea for a little bit, uh, for instance, asking yourself the serious question of what is language and what is a thought. Little tip on that last part, consider Jung's contention that ideas have people rather than people have ideas. And all of a sudden, you're in a cosmic relational forest as both a participant and a vector for other participants. And I, I prefer the Foucault version, of course, but if you look at um, Foucault's understanding of history, it's essentially a flow model of both history and truth. Haunt that, and you get close enough to several you know, indigenous cosmologies, quote-unquote, uh, as well as Charles Fort's notion of dominance. So what we need is a way of talking about and thinking with the imaginal that doesn't defang it with kind of, I guess, lingering enlightenment notions, but also doesn't tip completely into the opposite mode uh, of thinking that hmm, completely jettisons empirical observation as having no value. Uh, and if you've done the Magical Geography course, you'll be aware, I think, we find that in the notion of wayfinding, uh, at least as described by uh, Dr. Ringold. And I've been thinking about how this might work for uh, allowing specialness. Uh, and, and by that, I mean, last time we had Dr. Kripal on the show, we're talking about how we do comparison and in, in, in that sort of um, 20th century postmodern, again, that's not quite the right word, but um, comparison by leveling, comparison by, and this is a right move in the sense of we don't want to make any um, racial or ethnic or cultural claims of superiority or betterness in comparison. But as Dr. Kripal says, um, I think India is special. So we need a way of going, well, um, India is somewhere on the planet that, ha that developed the most potent, you know, consciousness technology alone of, of anywhere, right? So we're talking specifically about meditation, um, which variants of it are found in other ways, but India is special because it spent, you know, 5,000 years <laughs> um, doing this. So how do we say that? How do we say special without superior? And Professor Ingold solve, um, well, has a self for, I guess, a different but still extant kind of special, which is the, in the same way India emerges, well, meditation emerges in India, and so we need a way of thinking with that. Uh, empiricism and the scientific method also emerge with a, within a similarly tight geographical area. And he uses the example... Uh, in a um, piece called Against Space. He uses the example of some climate scientists being helicoptered along a straight line in the Russian Arctic, dropping down every 50 kilometers to a point that matches the, the map that they'd written beforehand to take soil sample. These data are then passed up into an abstracted model, uh, and he contrasts that with the experience of the local helicopter pilot, who is in fact piloting these scientists around, right? And so I'm going to quote from the piece, uh, and we'll begin that now. Inhabitants, in short, know as they go, as they journey through the world along a path of travel, far from being ancillary to the point-to-point -point collection of data to be passed up for subsequent processing into knowledge. Movement itself is the inhabitant's way of knowing. I have trawled the vocabulary of English to find a word grammatically equivalent to laterally and vertically, that would convey this sense of knowing along, rather than across or up. But I have found nothing. I have therefore had to resort to an awkward neologism. Inhabitant knowledge, we could say, is integrated alongly. Thus, instead of the complementarity of a vertically integrated science of nature and a laterally integrated geography of location, wayfaring yields an alongly integrated practical understanding of the life world. Such knowledge is neither classified nor networked, but meshworked. 
In reality, of course, scientists are human like everyone else, and so, like everyone else, they are also wayfarers. Thus, the picture of scientific practice presented in the example above is somewhat idealized. It corresponds, if you will, to the official view of what is supposed to happen. In the actual conduct of scientific investigation, materials collected in the field are not sent up, but along to the laboratory, which is, after all, just another place where the work goes on. Thus, Contrary to the official view, what goes for inhabitant knowledge also goes for science. In both cases, knowledge is integrated not fitting local particulars into global abstractions, but in the movement, place to place, in wayfaring. Scientific practices have the same place-binding, but not place-bound, character as the practices of the inhabitants. Science, too is meshworked. So this is a underlying model for eruptions of specialness. So instead of making the creation of discrete facts um, the baseline epistemology for your comparison. Do you know what I mean? So if, if you have fact as it emerges from empiricism and you use that as a base, um, it makes empiricism universal and the rest a subset of it. Uh, Ingold makes the generation of epistemologies as a result of human wayfinding the universal. So one of the things Northwest European culture created on its way, or on its wayfinding, through time, is empiricism. By switching these up, by basing it in the idea that um, wayfinding generates epistemologies rather than um, an epistemology Northwest Europe generated has this capacity to create facts that it can self-referentially say are true. If we make the creation of epistemologies via humans alongly uh, experiencing place and time, you're in a better, I, I would argue only, um, first step to do comparison, and it allows us to use the available epistemologies appropriately, and hopefully interact and possibly learn from other life ways in a more balanced fashion. So you see, it's not a dismissal of empiricism, it's understanding or situating empiricism as a thing that happened uh, because humans generate epistemologies via wayfinding. So we can use it, it's just not one ring to rule them all, you know? So here's a potential way, I think, of thinking with India's specialness, or Brazil's spirit and UFO-based specialness, or the emergence of empiricism in Northwest Europe. We make wayfinding the universal, not the generation of discrete facts that are either universally true or false. It makes it the right size to be useful again. So that's step one for comparison. Uh, this is really useful. Again, step one, what we talk about when we talk about dragons, we have to do that bit first. That's comparison. So we'll, I'll give you another quotation now. This one is uh, about twisted language, and it's from Jeremy Narby in a book called DMT Dialogues. So we've done, you following me? We've got comparison. Now we need to talk about talk. And this is the quote. Yamanahua people drink ayahuasca, which they call shori, and communicate in their visions with yoshi beings. Yoshi are invisible, and they animate plants and animals, but they are also multifaceted and ambiguous, and all reports of them underline the fundamental difficulty of knowing them. These entities emit songs, and shamans listen to the songs, sing along with them, and learn to communicate with these entities by singing their melodies back to them. But they use words. And the language that they sing to these entities is deliberately abstruse and metaphoric. They speak what is called tsai yoshito yoshito, meaning language twisting twisting, or twisted language. Almost nothing in twisted language is called by its usual name. Jaguars are called baskets. Anacondas are called hammocks. Fish are called peccaries. In each case, there is an obscure but real connection between the two terms. Jaguars are called baskets because certain fibers used to make baskets have patterns similar to the markings of a jaguar. Anacondas are called hammocks because as they hang from trees, they sometimes look like hammocks. Yamanahua shamans say that they use this twisted language to talk to the multifaceted Yoshi beings because normal words would crash into them. 
Whereas with twisted words, you can go close, but not too close and circle around and see them clearly. So it's like with a boomerang, you aim it over there to impact here. You say one thing to mean another. This is how you address yourself to these multifaceted and fundamentally ambiguous beings who have no unitary nature. So here, metaphor is not incorrect naming. It is the only naming possible. Think about that. Metaphor is the only naming possible. Why do sigils have to be composed the way they are? Why do they work better if you mess them up before you squish them down? Sigils twisting, twisting. Uh, here's a homework thought exercise. Consider the curious iconography and image associations of, you know, grimoire spirits or the zodiac or of star spirits in general in light of twisted language. So that's a homework exercise. But for now, consider two things. How do we learn from or port this concept into our life ways in a fashion that isn't extractive or that doesn't break it apart on impact? This is a good example, I think, of animism as epistemology rather than ontology, because once we've done our Kripalesque comparison work with the notion of, well, with, with this Yamanahua notion, we have a completely new mode, at least to us, of interrogating quote-unquote paranormal events from the weird utterances of UFOs to so-called tricks to components of poltergeist activity and, and so on. Are our current words crashing into them? It's food for thought. Are we spying something, problematic though this term is, structurally universal when it comes to spirit contact here? This is a thing we can spy when we get comparison to work well, and then we start looking for uh, epistemological insight in uh, non-European or well, non-enlightenment cultures. Bonus points for the postmodernists out there. What does the notion of twisted language do to Derrida's model that I mentioned at the beginning of the episode? Bonus points for premium members. Is twisted language how Eduardo Cohn's forest language goes from non-symbolic to symbolic when it needs or wants to? As Donna Haraway writes, go outside English and the wild multiplies. So those are the two pieces I want to table. I want to table opening up comparison uh, in a way that allows for empiricism, but doesn't uh, make a big fucking deal of it. And also the notion that there is, for very good reasons, I suspect, only one way of talking about a kind of wider spirit world. And, uh, and those, that's why I wanted to table both of these things. So now, <laughs> now we talk about wayfinding through like a Balrog fight, basically. I mentioned in the show with Austin when we were, you know, still in exile. Um, my God. Uh, you could tell that this was, you know what it's like, but there's, there's some kind of um, magical fight or battle because in addition to the general disaster, everything went wrong. The the car that I mentioned kind of jokingly, although it sort of wasn't, that, you know, it wouldn't start every time. Um, it, not just that, but because it wouldn't start every time, sometimes the um, you'd have to sort of turn it half on to lock or unlock it. And if you weren't careful, because you have all your worldly belongings in the back of it, you'd leave it in a car park unlocked somewhere um, while you were going to go and get supplies because it didn't lock. Um, the tire started going flat until it finally went flat. Um, it had a speed wobble and all of these things. I mean, I don't usually drive in an unsafe fashion like that, but all of these things happen because uh, my mechanic is in another town threatened by fire. And he also had my truck, which was also being threatened by fire. And that, he still got it because he couldn't get the parts because of the fire. But the most incredible things happen. So I'm, I'm here trying to, and it's, um, I'll have more to say about this during the course. But some of the books that I saved were ones that I needed to refer back to to put the, the Q1 um, ancestors and working with the dead course together. And you guys, many of you have a magical library. Books literally vanish. I'm not, that's not a, you know, oh, I guess I, I guess I misplaced it. Like, it's kind of hard to misplace it when they're all just in the one boot of a car. And they vanished. And then, of course, they showed up. Uh, in a pile that it wasn't in when we finally unpacked a library, which I still haven't put back on the shelves because I'm just going to wait a week or so uh, in case I have to throw them all back in. Oh, the most incredible stuff. Like um, I sort of mentioned once James got back, 
um, for their week. I'm like, everything is going wrong, not in a hysterical way, but like, just be aware everything is going wrong. Um, we had gas pumps that wouldn't work for us and the attendants would come out going, I'm sorry, I don't know what happened. This was just fixed. Um, key cards into hotel rooms wouldn't work. Um, I lost the key to the one car that actually worked. Uh, oh my God. Like all of this stuff, it was, it's all, it's like you couldn't actually dial this back up. And um, I'll get to the tactics about how, how you roll with that later. But I just have to give you the final death of the car, which was on Monday. And it, because it's a flow-on effect from the fire, right? So we all got back on Thursday. Uh, I had visitors uh, who left on the Sunday. So Monday was theoretically my first day back um, to a version of normal life. We were going to do a live Q&A. I was going to get, you know, blogging and podcasting and all that kind of stuff done. Uh, and uh, James leaves very early in the morning to fly to Sydney to go to work for that week. And I said, take the unreliable car so that I'm not trapped here if, you know, the fire comes back or whatever. And uh, he gets all the way to Hobart, which is a place I'd been zipping backwards and forwards to and from for over 20 days. And um, the tire goes fully flat. And so he parks it in some pharmacist car park and um rings and says i have to get an uber or i'll miss my flight so i'm there racing back up to hobart for fire business again oh it's a public holiday i should also mention that so trying to find someone to replace that and then i get to the car and the electrics are completely fucked so it's not even just turn it on another time and i'm there going and this is all the flow on effect from the fire because i haven't been able to get anything fixed um it was yeah it's been a trip now Let's talk about, well, let me tell you about the tactics in a situation like this. Now, there's some sort of short-term intuition stuff, which, again, will be in the course that's based pretty much on some of the things Edgar Casey would say about how you use these capacities. So there's a, a daily divination and intuition combination of, can this be pushed? Should I be here? Restricting on a day-to-day -day basis down to yes, no's, because you're looking for, in a kind of triage situation, the probabilities you can move the most, right? So it would be those combinations and evening journeying on the possibilities of what weather things can shift, and then hitting them on a daily basis with either more prayers or journeying or Orphic hymns or invocation, calling upon existing allies and, and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and from, well, what is it now? I still think of it as the weekend. So from weekend before last, uh, it became apparent that I could probably handle the rest of the specific farm protection solo. And so what we did, what I did was pivoted the various intending groups that were um, helping out with that for the prior week um, towards that more macro goal of actually putting these fires that covered maybe more than 5% of the state out rather than, protecting, rather than protecting a little particular property or town. Uh, and that's when Austin agreed to find the best rain election for the group work. Uh, and... One of the reasons we settled on a sort of mansion mantra combo in conjunction with Freedom Cole, who having absolutely no reason to be helpful, nevertheless was and gets an individualized and sincere, sincere thank you uh, as well. Um, I say there's no reason to be helpful. We don't know each other, but um, we use some uh, very explicit Vedic um, tech that were the stuff he learned um, when he was in India. And, um, you know, he knows Austin and so on, but he certainly never met me. So big thank you there. And one of the reasons we settled on a mansion mantra combination is the um, more traditional space weather wasn't that good for what, what it is we were trying to do. I mean, again, reference the show uh, that Austin and I did. So that's what we did. Um, and we settled on a, a Vasuki mantra. Uh, and so we're essentially dealing with um, nagas and, and rain dragons and, and all this kind of stuff. And I just, when Austin told me that, it all, I hate to say it all made sense, but it was my, it was like, ah, oh, this is an interesting six month dragon and eclipse and whatever cycle. I'll come to that. But before we do, um, I want to talk about the episode of the show that Dr. Seppi was on. And there's a, I, I shared one of her articles at the, uh, the base of it, which I'm going to, another quote coming at you now. In most tribal traditions, no data are discarded as unimportant or irrelevant. 
their own individual experiences, the accumulated wisdom of the community uh, that has been gathered by previous generations, their dreams, visions, and prophecies, and any information received from birds, animals, and plants as data that must be arranged, evaluated, and understood as a unified body of knowledge. So, no data are discarded as unimportant or irrelevant. Now, when Austin landed on dragons, which was an upgrade, we were simply going to do like a moon-water combination. I say simply, you know, I still would have done that, right? <laughs> Whatever it takes to dunk. Um, when it turned out to be dragons, I'm like, well, of course it has to be dragons. Uh, <sighs> All right. So some of you know, I actually did a solo show about it in July of last year. But at the end of the Q2 course, I gave myself a week of a bit less than a week of just decompressing. And it's the middle of winter here. And um, it had occurred to me I hadn't watched the final extended Hobbit. I'd seen the um, the original or theatrical cut in the theater. And I'm like, maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll watch all three Hobbit films. And I did. And the show was about, like, actually, I um, I like these a lot better than I, I remembered liking them. And I got pretty into it, right? Um, as in, usually when I'm giving myself a few days to kind of, like, deep dive into a text, um, I get quite into it. Uh, and one of the things I did was listen to or find um, music on, on YouTube and Spotify that was sort of Hobbit adjacent. And if you are unaware, because you are much cooler than me, there's a kind of clique of about five or six YouTubers all having like eight to 10 million subscribers who are kind of like, they do weird karaoke versions of things like Disney songs where they all sing like where one person will sing all of the parts and they'll do weird um, Moana and, and whatever medleys, Moana and Hercules medleys and so on. So um, if you're, you know, in the mood for a deeply uncool YouTube hole one night, you're welcome. And one of the, one of the ones that, well, I found these guys because I was looking for Tolkien and Hobbin, Hobbit music. Um, and one of the guys is called Peter Hollands. And he has like a whole album of like, Middle Earth songs from the movies, not the actual, which is, to be honest, what I was looking for. I was looking to see who's done albums of Tolkien music because, like, literally everyone uh, except Dr. Be Dr. Tarnas, I don't know, like, I skip the uh, the actual music in the books, right? I, st I skip the songs. And I'm like, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get this right. I'm going to find an actual musician. Anyway, so one of them... Uh, I was driving up to the supermarket and there is, I think it's the, um, I think it's the theme song to the third Hobbit film that he's singing. And there's, there's lines in it about, um, it's basically, it's called I see fire. And the, and the song is essentially about, I see fire burning the trees, like fire along the mountaintop and crashing down onto this small town and, and all this kind of weird, not, not weird, just, language from a or lines from a song and obviously it's wet and there's you know the valley typically is all kind of like misty and clouds tumbling into the river and i remember driving up the river as this terrible song was being played and looking at the the ridge line of the mountains and the trees and being tremendously affected by and in that in that weird way so that's pretty much exactly six months to the day from when all of this stuff happened and, you know, I really did see fire burning the trees and, and along the mountainsides uh, multiple times. Uh, what was once wet and, and misty when I heard the song but was affected by it, uh, it seemed very resonant to, you know, evacuating multiple times and, and, and coming back to do what ended up being dragon magic. Um, it's also worth noting, I think, that... Perhaps the only quote-unquote fiction book I've read over the, over the summer was Lord of the Rings, uh, and it was in an ultra-deep reading, thanks to Dr. Beckett's recent course. So this is one of those no-data-are-irrelevant things, right? Um, the other part that made me realize, goodness, this is a water dragon thing, is the Sunday when I left Coffs Harbor, where I was giving that um, presentation, which for premium members is in the bonus member material area now. The morning, the Sunday morning when I was due to fly out, first thing I did, got up and went for a swim in the pool and was sort of flanked by water dragons, which is the name for this kind of like endemic 
a medium sized lizard. They were, I was riddled, well, the, the apartment was riddled with them. And then as I was swimming, just morning swimming, because I was coming back here to somewhere allegedly cold rather than on fire, I was flanked by water dragons. And then from basically that Sunday night when I landed in the valley, I could smell the smoke. And where these two pieces wove together for me, there's a line in the um, Peter Holland's version of the um, theme song. Desolation comes upon the sky. And when I woke up on the Monday and it was blood red. And, and I whispered that to myself. I knew it had to have come from somewhere tolkien -esque, But I was standing outside and whispered to myself, desolation comes upon the sky. And I, thought, I wonder what that's about and where that happened. Like, why, was, why did that emerge from my unconscious in a no data are irrelevant way? So that's the kind of draconian backstory to the um, precisely elected time I had to come back through road closures so that I could be the focal point for uh, this, you know, a Vasuki invocation mantra thing, what have you. And I did some journeying uh, immediately when I got down here, because obviously there's still, you know, fire and, and smoke and whatever everywhere. And it's a journeying on, on the farm and the area around the town. Uh, and the guardians that I had seen the week before between the forest and the town had moved off. I mentioned that in the previous show. And I took that to be a good sign. So there was, there was, no, there was less of that kind of like Benetton parade of different spirit beings in between the forest and the town. And it was also the first time I could see heavy rain in spirit vision. And once again, I must stress, there was a 0% chance of it on the horizon. Uh, we had across the state between 30 and 70% less than average annual rainfall for January, and February is the, f is the driest month. So there we were at the end of Jan looking at the actual bushfire month with nothing on the horizon. But in spirit vision, that's what I could see. Um, the, the impression, because again, Whilst the uh, Vasuki mantra um, mansion combination exists as a thing, the way we did it with, you know, 100 people, uh, and for this reason, some of whom hadn't done this before and, and what have you, was hyper-experimental. So I was something of a lab test, and the impression during the experience of being the focal point for it was fascinating. Um, there was also some which is um, in the premium members area, and I won't go into it here. Um, other components of that first, or that journey I did when I got back to the farm were precise matches for when Austin comes on and explains the backstory of uh, Vasuki and, and these particular entities and the fact that they have beef specifically with forest fire and, and all this kind of shit. Um, oh, and the other important part was um, their realm is, uh, is an underworld realm, so under the earth and under the water. And so being the focal point of this uh, intense exercise was a, a sense of tremendous amount of pressure. Now, we as premium members do a lot of simultaneous group work, and it, was, it almost felt the opposite. It felt like uh, if you scuba dive, this is literally what it felt like. It felt like descending on a deep dive and a night dive in particular, because I couldn't actually see anything. Uh, and towards the culmination of it, it felt like... Um, through the gloom of a deep night dive, I could see the sort of um, the glowing jewels that um, dragons like Vasuki have um, on their forehead. So if you think of deep sea fish and, the, and the, the kind of lights they have at the front of them, it was like that, but through the gloom and s sort of circling around me slowly in, in the way you don't want sharks to be doing <laughs> um, on, a, on a night dive in a, in a becoming aware or eyeing off um, fashion. And so we did that, and um, and we did whatever else we could, um, James and I, to sort of attempt to keep the house uh, safe from ember strike. Uh, and then we headed back up to Hobart. And again, the roads closed um, <laughs> on us as uh, as we went back up. And that night, I had um, th some specific Vasuki after effects. I'm fair, like I, I'm 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 sure, like it was f complete insomnia which actually does sometimes happen with group work and when you're the focus of it. That's, that's in many respects, quote unquote, normal, but also burning, burning heat. Uh, and, and that was it. And it was just kind of a bit of a weird daze. And again, because we hadn't done this, we didn't know, 
knew it was going to happen, right? I had every confidence that, as I predicted at the time, the rain was going to show up on Thursday morning. Um, so this is just kind of rolling through that. Now, um, the rain did show up. And as I said, it rained every day after that. But when it arrived on schedule, it, um, and this is that how, how, what we talk about when we talk about dragons. It was a slow-moving dragon, almost like a, almost like a blimp. It was moving like that. It was just slow moving, effortlessly just doing what it does. It felt like a correction to an imbalanced universe. And we got the target amount of uh, millimeters right on the farm. Fire service said nothing will happen unless we get a, a rain dump of 25 mils in like an hour or two. And we got, because we have our own, obviously, um, data generating weather stations on the farm. And uh, we got 26 mils specifically on the farm. And as I said, it rained every day after that. Uh, and those rain events were retinue dragons. That was, it wasn't Vasu day one was Vasuki, and yesterday was Vasuki, and it's it uh, Vasuki came back in that same slow moving way, and that's when I started. And this is the other reason, I guess, why the show uh, is is a little bit late. I was honestly waiting for this stuff to end. Every day it rained in between now and then. And it was a retinue dragon, and Vasuki came back on sort of like Tuesday, Wednesday for the mop up. And uh, the so, yeah, and that Tuesday was after the broken car incident. It poured with a rain that would honestly put the fires of hell out. So, we're talking Thursday morning Australia time. That was Tuesday, and that was the day I knew it's completely done. There, there, it is impossible for any fire to be left around here. To the point, I said this to uh, Austin amusingly, it's literally cold enough to think about putting a fire on. Uh, and yeah, and so each of the smaller days between those two um, also got good rainfall, but it was smaller retinue dragon. So I messaged Austin, as I said, it's ironic that um, I'm cold enough to think about putting the fire on on the first day that uh, I'm not worried about a fire. Well, you know what I mean. Um, so I messaged Austin to tell him that this is the final Vasuki round uh, and it's done. Uh, messaged him on Skype. Uh, and he said, well, that's interesting because at that exact moment, he was doing his own Vasuki thank you. So, you know, we'll call that something of a hit, right? So what are we to do with... I need a final piece of what we talk about when we talk about dragons, because here we have, you know, empirical, what's the word? We have psi data to show that this is a thing we've done. Uh, we have a way of using twisted language in comparison to free up these things so that I can say it without bracketing. And then there's a final piece. Uh, and before that, there's a final piece, and it, it's sort of, again, this will come up in the Ancestors and the Dead course in a particular module, but there is the um, post-colonial or uh, post-settler motivations behind what went on with the fire. But before we get to that, I'm thinking about how, as a final stitching together of all of this, remember Crowley wrote, and it's sort of unhelpfully bombastic, but you get what he's going with, like to treat every action or occurrence as a direct communication between God and your soul. Now, I actually think Chris Knowles's definition of synchromysticism improves dramatically on that, um, while still essentially saying the same thing, just in a, in a more, I would say, um, healthy and, and less um, maniacal way. And, and synchromysticism in Chris's definition is performing depth psychology on culture. So somewhere in between those two and along with um, no data are irrelevant is what we talk about when we talk about dragons or prophecy or um, how these things impact. This is how you can talk about how giant large scale disasters can affect you individually, in this case me, obviously, without saying that it was because of me. Do you know what I mean? That's the, the final piece of what we need to find when we talk about dragons. And somewhere in between depth psychology on culture and, and, and making Crowley's statement less maniacal, but still there, and no data are irrelevant, right? So as I mentioned to Austin, and in the subsequent 
uh, week or so, my impression of a um, a faction of understandably angry um, native Tasmanian dead being involved in the fire, which moved like a war party. So it hid in the forests uh, and, and until nightfall and would race down towards settled areas. And the, the firemen, every night of this, had to work out which town it was coming to. So it, it, we had fire service people saying, I've done this for 25 years. Um, I have never seen a fire behave this way. It's traveling against the wind in some points, you know. Um, so for whatever that is, right? Anyway, so I've had um, not just uh, Austrian, Austin's astrology kind of matching my journeying impressions, but I've had a number of other uh, verifications that this is a thing. And the final one, well, not necessarily the final one, but on, on mothers, in Mother's Network of Weirdos, right? There's a woman who, and let, let me describe it this way. She, when she was doing impressions of what the kind of motivations or backstory for this fire and what it wanted was, she's going to talk about it in, in, in her words, in her language. She said it's something to do with ley lines going back to England and, and, it, and them being, yeah, like wrong or, or what have you. Now, Mother said, I don't think that's right. And I agree. But honestly, from a remote viewing perspective, if that was, you'd consider that a remote viewing hit, right? So what is, she doesn't. You know, doesn't do post-colonialism, but she, and uses words like ley lines and things that we don't. But look at that and go, that's a not wrong additional piece of verification. And the reason I'm telling you that one is, how would that close out? How, and I don't mean this, it's solved, obviously, but how would how would a proper or a properly manifested, healthy English ley line? What would you take as a indication that it had succeeded? Well, what would be for you one of the you know most beautiful and benign expressions of Englishness? For me, it's Nigella Lawson, and uh, you'll never guess who we were two or three rows from. Obviously, we'd booked these tickets last year before this. You don't just leave a disaster. Well, maybe I would. You don't just leave a disaster to go and. Um, you know, meet Nigella. Uh, so the Wednesday night, we're up in Hobart, still can't go back to the farm. And it's uh, the first, uh, and Hobart's north of us, right? So she's there on stage, and we went outside for a cigarette, and that was like the first of the heavy rain. It hadn't hit the valley yet. That was going to hit Thursday when it did. And I'm like, that's interesting. So this whole experience with the dragons and the... Uh, one of the origins of the fire and so on ends not just with like a perfect manifestation of Englishness arriving with the rain, which is Nigella. Well, so we stayed overnight. And then that morning I picked up friends of mine from London who came. I hadn't been to the farm. I stayed up in Hobart to pick them up from the airport. And so I came back to the farm with people who live in London. And that whole thing kind of, and that's, I don't know what to do with that. Uh, and it's one of the other reasons why I had to give myself an extra few days to process and, and make sure that the story had run its course as this defined or discrete adventure. And I think it has. Obviously, there are endless flow and effects, like we're a month into the year and I'm a month behind in my work. That one's great. Uh, I'll also say that I've had some... Uh, the last couple of nights of, of dream activity since I've been here on my own have been piecing this stuff together, but also uh, a, a revelation that I'm, I'm quite happy with uh, during the fire. And in fact, it was on the Wednesday or the Thursday when this all kind of de-risked, thanks to Vasuki and, uh, and the premium members who helped out. Um, there was an, a, a news article from the mainland that indigenous fire techniques are going to be used uh, in, in Victoria. As, as a fire management. And I just have this impression and bearing in mind uh, native Tasmanians, existing native Tasmanians are um, coming from further behind in their post-colonial journey than the rest of mainland, uh, you know, native, native peoples or first peoples. But I just have this impression that in my lifetime, 
I guarantee that indigenous uh, techniques will be used as government policy here. And that, that's quite good. Um, that's, a, that's a really nice thing. To, obviously, it's quite good. But it's a really nice thing to wake up from going, oh, wow, that's actually going to happen. Uh, yeah, that's at least one of the things that I think the project was for um, on, a, on, a, on a spirit vision side. And there will be more about this. In the Q1 course, again, uh, when we deal with ancestral remediation. But for now, uh, this is a, I think that's enough. <laughs> and this is a sincere, sincere thank you um, for all your efforts and, and your concerns. And hopefully normal programming resumes now. Until next time. Oh, misty eye of the mountain below. Keep careful watch of my brother's souls And should the sky be filled with fire and smoke Keep watching over during sunset. <laughs> This is to end in fire Then we should all burn together Watch the flames climb higher Into the night Calling out Father oh, Stand by and we will Watch the flames burn on and on The mountainside I We should die tonight We should all die together Raise a glass of wine For the last time Calling out Father Prepare as we will Watch the flames burn on and on The mountainside Desolation comes upon the sky See fire inside the mountain. I see fire burning the trees. I see fire hollowing souls. I see fire blood in the breeze. And I hope that you remember. Remember the